This is a presentation on congressional voting records for the Senate and the House. I was motivated to compile this because I couldn't find a good one online. Uh, most of them combine too many other issues. I'm interested in simply focusing on restoring the basics of American democracy and analyzing who we need to defeat, who we need to put pressure on, and who we need to support. These are the bills that we're focusing on. The Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act, which is a total lack of transparency about monitoring Americans' communications. The National Defense Authorization Act, specifically provisions 1021 and 1022, which declare America a permanent battlefield and allow indefinite detention of Americans without trial. <clears throat> CISPA, the Cyber uh, Internet uh, Information Sharing and Protection Act, which uh, is extremely vaguely worded, allowing companies to share information with the government at will based on whatever they consider a cybersecurity threat. Essentially, uh, no oversight and absolute impunity given to corporations to give your personal data to the government. The anti-occupy bill, which was known as House Resolution 347, which allows uh, severe criminal penalties for interfering with a congressperson or a secret service agent, uh, and this bill is uh, highly criticized. Other less key bills are the U.S.-Israel Security Cooperation Act, which uh, provides that we will guarantee that Israel always has military superiority over all combined threats, just after having sold $140 billion weapons, most in uh, history, to its enemies, therefore potentially putting us on the hook to have to give Israel $140 billion worth of weapons, which I'm sure that the defense companies would love. Um, and the Iran sanctions, which is escalating tensions with Iran and could actually strengthen the rulers in Iran. And finally, audit the Fed, because the Federal Reserve uh, enriches elites and finances wars. So this is the page that I have on the Microtopia website, which I'll post the URL to in the uh, description of this video that goes through and analyzes each House member's voting record, which you can download here. And so to make a long story short, we're just going to give you the list of finalists in the beginning, and you can look at this document yourself later. Um, the House has <clears throat> approximately uh, 242 Republicans in it and 193 Democrats and zero independents, showing a total lock on the House of uh, the two-party state. And of this, 3% uh, of Republicans vote against laws that are dismantling the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. 35% uh, of Democrats do. 90% uh, of Republicans vote to dismantle the Bill of Rights and Constitution, 17.62% of Democrats do, and 8% of Republicans are in between, and 46% of Democrats are in between. The best Democrats, uh, I shouldn't say that, the best Democrats and Republicans, um, I'm still fighting my early conditioning, um, are in this list right in here. So let me go specifically to voting record on totalitarian laws and bring up at the very end of this document the people that have the best scores. And so we have a group of largely Democrats that, are, uh, that vote in general uh, uh, to defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but not always. And then the hardcore positive group of people that we need to support um, are right here. Uh, Walter Beeman Jones, Raul Grijalva, Pete Stark, who's gone, Timothy Tim Thompson, a Republican, along with Walter Beeman Jones, John Turney, Hanson Clark, who's been redistricted out, uh, Ron Paul, who is retired, Tammy Baldwin, and Justin Amash, who is certainly some new blood, and Dennis Kucinich, who has been districted out. So you see, a lot of these, pe very few people fail to be reelected in the House of Representatives if you look at a historical uh, framework. And it's very interesting that we lose this guy, and we lose this guy, and we lose this guy. Three of them. Bang, bang, bang. Now uh, that I want to be co uh, conspiratorial. And of the um, problematic people, 
um, we can go from 182 up. Those are the really severe ones. Voted uh, in general, all of them without exception voted uh, for the uh, Declaring America a Permanent Battlefield, uh, voted for the uh, cyber, uh, <clears throat> cyber Internet uh, Information Sharing and a pro a Protection Act. Uh, they voted for the ability to arrest people who get near the Secret Service or uh, 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 Congress people or even get near buildings that they're intending to visit. Um, the, they voted for the Foreign Intelligence Act. They voted uh, against removing the indefinite detention clause. So these are some really tough characters that should all be highly re-educated or defeated. In the Senate, uh, the best senators are definitely the two senators from Oregon, Jeff Merkley and Ron Wyden, who voted against the Senate cybersecurity equivalent. They voted against the NDAA. Uh, most of them are co-sponsors co-sponsors of Audit the Fed, although Audit Fed is very popular with Republicans in the Senate. Um, uh, many of them are sponsors of the attempts to uh, reform FISA. Um, these are the people that have, uh, it hasn't come to the floor yet. And then these people all voted uh, uh, on the amendment to remove indefinite detention. As you can see, uh, many people did, 70 senators did, although ironically only seven voted initially to oppose the NDIA 2012. And these are the guys who voted to keep the uh, ability to keep us under lock and key forever uh, with, very, with uh, no uh, transparency about how they arrived at that conclusion. So you can look all of this yourself up online. Please get to know these people and um, contact your Congress people uh, to oppose the NDAA as written because John McCain just eviscerated the amendment to it. So those of you who are, wish to can leave this presentation now and I want to provide a rationale for why these things are so. Uh, let's see here if I can get to this. So why is the, uh, so first of all, this is an interesting issue here, which is a support for CISPA. As you can, these correlate almost identically with the biggest contributors in the country. This is one list. Uh, and um, you can find information about these contributors here in this Mother Jones article. And uh, let's see, I think I have another list that is pretty scary about who supports it. This is the list of companies that support um, the uh, CISPA. So it's pretty uh, uh, not surprising that um, most of the Congress uh, passed this bill. Uh, it's quite extraordinary how many companies want to have immunity to pass on cyber threats to the government. <clears throat> So now my argument. My argument is essentially that the war on terror is actually a war on the Bill of Rights and the Constitution because the whole concept of the American nation is that we are uh, govern, government is by the consent of the governed. And if the power structure of the establishment get to the point where the governed feel they do not grant their consent anymore, this becomes revolutionary activity. And um, therefore, uh, the war on terror is a way of preventing the system and the establishment from being tossed out of power. And the, then there's a question of the use of the word terrorist. So the word terrorist is generally used to describe people who don't have a standing army, that are uh, a revolutionary nature, who um, are seeking to unseat some established power structure. So the word terrorist is thrown around. If you look at uh, Nazi or Soviet uh, or, or uh, People's Republic of China documents, you'll see who they consider terrorists. And Ronald Reagan considered the Iran-Contras, who are basically uh, death squads operating for the upper classes that had been overthrown of uh, this guy, Anastasio uh, Somoza, uh, who was a, not a pleasant uh, a king of Nicaragua at all. He called them the moral criminal of the Founding Fathers. So if you go through history, you'll find when you don't like the uh, freedom fighters, you call them terrorists. And when you do uh, like the terrorists, you call them freedom fighters. So you cannot have a war on terror uh, because uh, that means essentially a war on 
people that disagree with you. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a loose uh, way to put it. Now, uh, how do these laws affect us and our Bill of Rights? So, in the First Amendment, we have the freedom of speech, of press, of assembly, of the right to petition the government. CISPA attacks uh, the freedom of speech. Um, and an example of this is the ability to shut down politically controversial websites. Um, now, it doesn't explicitly state that, but it implicitly states that. FISA also chills speech because it, uh, uh, we know we're being surveilled. And this will tend to have self-censorship occur. The NDAA definitely attacks freedom of speech and freedom of association. Um, and uh, uh, by declaring America a permanent battlefield and the right to indefinitely detain. And H.R. 347 definitely uh, attacks the, the anti-occupy bill, definitely attacks uh, freedom of assembly. The Patriot Act attacks, uh, this is from another author uh, who describes the Patriot Act attacking freedom of association, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, in terms of audit the Fed, Ron Paul describes uh, Federal Reserve activity in terms of counterfeiting to put it into a constitutional framework. And of course, NDAA provisions attack the Constitution itself, as it does the Patriot Act, not just the uh, amendments, but the core, which establishes due process of law. Those are revoked in these documents. Um, now, the NDAA injures our uh, Third Amendment rights um, by declaring a permanent battlefield, and it, and it also destroys posse comitatus, our freedom to be arrested from the military. It allows Americans to be arrested by the military in the U.S., which was against the law previously. Um, in terms of our Fourth Amendment rights, protection from unreasonable search and seizure, both CISPA and FISA certainly violate that. The Patriot Act violates it. Um, in terms of our Fifth Amendment, uh, the right to due process uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> and let's see, no person shall be held to answer for or unless the presentment of a grand jury uh, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property. That due process of law. So um, we know NDAA uh, attacks that indefinite detention, definitely attacks that, and the Patriot Act eliminates the right to legal representation, which is part of the Fifth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment trial by jury is attacked by NDAA, eliminated as is in the Patriot Act, as is in this second column also deals with the Patriot Act. The Eighth Amendment, a cruel and unusual punishment, is certainly attacked by the NDAA provisions as well as the Patriot Act. And the Ninth Amendment, which says that our rights will not be taken away from us, uh, that are not specifically enumerated in the Constitution, are attacked by these things. Um, and this is all on my uh, web page that I posted. <clears throat> My name is Alexander Hagen. Thank you very much. Good night and good luck.